We, uh, this morning we're talking about growing young, and, and we're starting a new series, a new sermon series um, called uh, Jesus Tweets, and so, um, so, so um, you know, I just think, you know, Michael told me I had to work in some kind of a joke about, you know, Jesus, uh, you, know, uh, you know, saying, come follow me on Twitter, but anyway, so um, I guess I just did that, I don't know, but anyway, uh, this, so we're going to be talking about Jesus tweets the next few weeks, and some of those kind of common Jesus sayings that maybe we need to be reminded of, or maybe we need to take a second look at, so that, um, you know, so that we can really feel uh, the full brunt of the teaching that Jesus was trying to give us. So this is, um, this is a Jesus tweet um, this morning, uh, maybe Jesus would have tweeted this if Jesus lived today, if Jesus had ever activated a Twitter account, um, he might have tweeted, um, see these kids, they're awesome. Be like them. Uh, it has to be less than 140 characters. So this is that's what we're doing these next few weeks. And we're going to be looking, uh, the, the extended version of this tweet uh, is found in Luke chapter 18. And we're looking at verses 15 through 17. I want to invite you guys to hear the word of God this morning. You know, this book is not just some book that's dead that was written 2,000 years ago. It's a living word, and it was written uh, to really help, uh, to help us to know how to live. It tells us uh, who Jesus is and who God is and what he wants from us and why all this stuff matters. Um, it tells us uh, the depth of God's love for us, that he would literally rather die than to live without us. I mean, it's an incredible, uh, God's word is an incredible uh, thing for us to, to look at and study. So that's why we read it in the service. That's why when I talk, um, I don't just make up stuff. I try to talk from this. So I want to invite you to hear God's word for all of us today. Um, in Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 15 through 17, it's pretty short this morning. But uh, let's hear what Jesus has to say. Uh, People were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, like a little child, will never enter it. Will you guys pray with me? God, I do pray that your word would speak this morning. Um, I pray, uh, God, that that you would either speak a word through me or you would speak a word in spite of me. Either way, God, we know um, that we all came this morning to hear a word from you. And so we ask that your Holy Spirit be our teacher in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. So I got some some YouTube videos. I, I don't know if you guys have noticed this or not, but in our culture, sometimes we try to, we try to all pretend like, like kids, especially little kids, are like really innocent, you know, and they're pure and they're all that stuff. And, um, and you know, little kids are awesome. So I, I see some little kids in this room. You guys are awesome. You guys rock. But you're just as messed up as the rest of us, okay? <laughs> um, and so, and I, cause I, and, and I love you when I say that, right? I love you when I say that, but I just, I just, I, I went, it didn't take me long. It took me like 15 seconds on YouTube to find, you know, some two-year-olds who just proved the theory that when Jesus is talking about be like little kids, he's not talking about this. So let's show some, let's show the first one up here. What do you, hi guys, are you best friends? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. What's your name? Anna Marie. What's your name? Nicola. How old are you? Two. How old I are you? Two. No, I'm two. No, you fly. No, I'm I two. two. No, I two. No, I two. No. No, I'm two. No, I two. No, I two. I'm two. I'm two. <laughs> now, I think the police had to be called to stop this altercation right here. And it's really funny to me to think that um, it's as if there can only be one two-year-old in the whole universe, right? I just think that's really funny. But these guys are two years old, and they've, either they've already learned it, or it was a part of kind of who they were when they were, you know, kind of, we were all kind of made uh, in that way in some sense. So, so let's look at another one.
You know, they're getting married young these days. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it just drives me crazy. No, I think that, that's, you know, that's pretty crazy, man. These are four-year-olds, and they're just going out, you're a bad kid. No, you're a bad kid. I mean, I was, you know what was really sick? Is that, that those ki- one of those kids' parents was videotaping that. Right? They didn't step in to stop it. They're just like, oh. And if you, hear, if you listen to it at the very end, she's like, oh, he said go. He said go. Like, like they were laughing because that was funny to them. Parenting. All right, so one more. We got one more. Tell me what you just said. I, I like you when you give me cookies. You like me when, when I give you cookies, but you don't like me all the time? Yeah, no. Why? But I like you, only like you again cookies. So, me. Oh, so only when I give you cookies do you like me? Yeah. Oh, okay, I love you. I, I love you too, but uh, I, I don't like you all the time. Oh, okay, thanks. I love you too, but I don't like you all the time, right? That kind of sums up a lot of our relationship with God, right? I mean, you know, God, I only love you when you give me cookies. I don't know. It's just, it's just crazy. These kids are young, but they have already either learned it or maybe they were born with it, you know. But the reality is um, when Jesus is talking about being like a little kid, he's not, talking, uh, he's not talking out of this idea, this cultural idea that children are perfect and they're pure. He's not. That was not even the understanding that uh, the culture in Jesus' day really even had of children. So we're going to get to kind of what Jesus was saying when he was talking about how awesome kids were um, and how, why we should be like them, but it wasn't this idea that they were pure. Man, it happens, it happens so young, right? So we're going to look uh, just at, at a, couple of, um, just a couple of things this morning uh, that just remind us um, you know, what Jesus really was trying to say. So the first thing we see here in Luke chapter 18, verses 15 through 17, and really you see it in the first two verses, verses 15 and 16. And this, I know this is going to seem really simple, right? I know this is, this is Christianity 101, but children are precious to God. And we've got some kids in this room right now, and, and I just want all the kids in this room to look right here. Look right here. Stare at the tip of my nose. I want you guys to know that you guys are precious to God, that the God of the universe loves you. And let me tell you how we know that. It's not just because Jesus, you know, said, hey, let the little children come to me, right? People were bringing, these parents, they were bringing their babies. And the word that's used here in the Gospel of Luke is a word that can be used for infants and babies, right? So they're bringing their infants and their babies to Jesus for him to bless them. It's obvious that these, these babies, these infants, that they're precious to their parents, and it's pretty understandable why they would be bringing them to Jesus. I mean, Jesus was, you know, he was a teacher, he was a healer, he did all this really cool stuff. I mean, he could heal people. And, and so in a world where, you know, uh, the, the child mortality rate was like 30% before age 6, and it was like 60% by age 16, you can totally understand why parents are bringing their kids to Jesus. You know, just, hey, he can heal people. Maybe if he just touches them, they'll be blessed. And so, and so these parents, because their kids are precious to them, they would bring them to Jesus, and, and Jesus, they, they wanted Jesus to bless them. Now, the, but the disciples, they got in the way of that. They, they were started doing what disciples do, right? Their, their job as disciples, one of their things to do was to, to really protect their teacher so that he could really focus on the things that he was supposed to be focusing on. So they were just doing what they thought was right. So they, you know, they saw these parents bringing their babies to Jesus, and they, and they stopped them. They said, whoa, 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 no. Now, quit bringing your babies to Jesus. And this is the moment where we really see just how precious children are to Jesus. You see, the reality is rabbis didn't hang out with kids. They didn't take time for kids. In the culture of Jesus' day, children were kind of seen and not heard. Some of you guys grew up with that sort of, that's kind of what your parents said, that you needed to be seen and not heard, right? But they were, the kids in Jesus' day were, they, we, again, we didn't, they didn't think of them as, as, oh, they're so pure and perfect and holy. They didn't have conversations about, you know, how we should not leave a huge national debt to our children. They didn't, you know, oh, we should improve the quality of education for our children. Children were sort of an afterthought in Jesus' day, and certainly the rabbis of Jesus' day. They didn't take time to hang out with kids. They had more important things to do. They had more important people, in quotes, to see. But Jesus was going to have none of that. So as the disciples start 
stopping these parents from bringing their babies to Jesus. Jesus stops them. And then he says these words, which, you know, pretty much anyone who's uh, paying attention has probably heard these words before. He says, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Where nobody else, no other teacher would have taken time to hang out with babies and kids, Jesus did. And, And by doing that, he showed everybody, including all of us today, how precious children are to Jesus. He showed them how precious Jesus, I mean, how precious children are to God. One of my favorite things to do is to, is to do baptisms and to, and to do um, dedica- prayers of dedication for infants and all that kind of stuff. And that's an important thing for parents. Think about how much, important, how much more important they thought it was to bring their babies to Jesus, and Jesus let them come. Jesus showed the whole world how precious children are to God. So the first thing, that's the, that's the first thing that we can learn from this is, you know, um, pres- children are precious to God. And that's, that's the reason we do VBS. That's the reason we do this kind of stuff. If children are precious to Jesus, should they not be precious to us, right? And so that's why we, we, we put so many staff hours in this. That's why we put so many volunteer hours and how much we put so much money into making this a great experience. Our prayer was this week that all the kids that came here, the 110 or whatever it was kids that came here this week, that they knew, that they knew, that they knew that God loved them, that they were important to Jesus and that they're important to us. That's why we do stuff like that, because of this right here, because Jesus said to the whole world, these, these children are precious. They're important just by what he did by letting them come and by blessing them. So that's the first thing we can see. And the second thing um, we can see here, and it's really the last thing I'm going to dwell on and talk about this morning, is that the message of Jesus is about growing young, not growing up. The message of Jesus is about growing young, not growing up. Again, in Jesus' day, they had no illusion that children were innocent or perfect or pure or holier than anybody else. That, that was not their understanding. So if they weren't talking about that, what were they talking about? What was Jesus talking about when he goes on to say in, uh, in verse 17 that unless we become like one of these little children, we will never inherit the kingdom of God, right? What was he really saying when he said that in verse 17? Well, He doesn't really say here exactly what he means. But if you take some cues from the context that this scripture is found in, I think we can we can piece together a pretty good idea of what Jesus is saying. This story is found right after another story um, in in Luke chapter 18. Uh, Really, two stories in a row that kind of have the same point. But the story immediately preceding this story is a story of a Pharisee and a tax collector. Now, you know that the Pharisees were the religious folks, and you know, everybody thought of them as, oh, they're the religious leaders, and they're pure and perfect and holy, and that kind of stuff. And then you had a tax collector who everyone thought of as kind of a cheat, right? They, they basically were assessed taxes by the Roman government, and then they would go out and collect. And the way they made their money was they would collect not only what they would owe to the people above them, but they, they made profit by collecting more, and they got to pretty much determine how much more they could take. So, so you had the, the Pharisee, this religious person who, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm holy and everybody thinks that. And then you had this tax collector who was kind of universally hated. And they go to the temple to pray. And the, and the Pharisee, this is his prayer. He, pray, he stands on the, on, on the corner there and he says, Lord, he looks over at the tax collector and says, thank you, but I am not like him. And then you have the tax collector over here who says a simpler prayer. And this is basically what he says is, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then Jesus talks about these two that are praying these opposite prayers. And he says, I tell you, the tax collector is the one who's justified before God. Because, and the basic idea is because he knows that he has nothing to commend him to God. He, he can't pretend like he's righteous. He can't pretend like he's holy. He can't pretend any of that stuff. He realizes, the tax collector realizes that he is at God's mercy. That it's only God's grace and God's mercy that's ever going to get him anywhere with God. Because he is so humble because he is broken, because he, he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't have a resume that he can hand to God saying, God, let me in. All he counts on is the mercy and grace of God. So that's the story that's immediately preceding this story. And then, and then the very next 
words. At the, as Jesus says, this tax collector is the one who's, who's justified before God. The very next words are, people were also bringing children or babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. It's as if that word also really makes this a continuation of the previous story. And it puts it in context. And so if you, if you think about the cultural view of, of children at that time, and you think of the context this is in, again, Jesus is not talking about in order to inherit the kingdom, you have to be innocent like these little children. No, what he's saying is, in order to inherit the kingdom, you have to be humble like these children. You have to be dependent like these children. You know, kids are dependent on their parents for everything when they're little. And our job as parents is a little bit every day to make them a little less, a little less dependent on us, right? I got a kid going off to college. I'm like, please get less dependent, right? She's not here. I can say that. But that's our job is to make that happen. But when children are little, they know, right? When, when they're really little, like this age of a child, they don't, they don't go and, you know, make themselves some food in the microwave, right? They, hopefully they don't go turn on the burner and, you know, boil some, you know, boil some noodles for spaghetti. No, they say, Mom, Dad, I'm hungry, right? When they need something, they ask for it. They know that they, ha- they have nothing uh, to commend themselves. They just, they basically are reliant on their parents. And I think when Jesus, and that's what that tax collector was doing. He's basically like, God, I got nothing. I'm not even going to pretend to be holy in front of you. Just have mercy on me, a sinner. I think when Jesus is, is, is saying this, this saying, he's reminding us to be more like these children so that we can inherit the kingdom of God, so that we can understand the kingdom of God, so that we can enter the kingdom of God. When he's doing that, he's basically saying, be like them. They know that they know that they can't pretend to be holy. They, they can't pretend to work themselves into heaven or any of that stuff. They, they're just relying on God's grace. They just trust that God loves them, which he does, and they just trust that. And that's what he's saying. You trust, you trust God like that. Now, just to really wrap things up, we all knew that once. We were all babies at one time. We all at one time knew what it was to surrender. We knew what it was to be dependent. We knew what it was to rely on somebody else. But as we got older, we started to build up that resume. And we started to write things down, and even our religious resume before God. And we would say, okay, God, um, you know, I give uh, X percentage of my money to you. And I go to church X Sundays per month, and that's a good thing. And I'm a greeter, or I'm a Sunday school teacher, or I'm a nursery worker, or I'm a sound tech, or whatever. I I, I volunteer my time, and I do all these things. And it's as if we think that we're going to put that on a resume and hand it to God, and he's going to go, oh, you did pretty well. Come on in. But the reality is, those are good things. All those things are good. Leading a Bible study at your work is a good thing. Feeding the homeless in your community is a good thing. Being a big brother or or, or big sister in your neighborhood is a great thing. Those are all great things. And they are things that God loves. But that's not what makes us right before God. What makes us right before God is remembering that, that those things are a way of saying thank you. Those things are not what we do to earn God's love. You don't do it to earn God's love. We do it because we have already God's love. God doesn't love us because of what we can produce for him. He doesn't love us because we are so holy or because we are so perfect. He loves us in spite of ourselves a lot of the time. And he loves us and he gives us grace and he gives us mercy because he can. That's why it's grace. Because he can and because he wants to. Because he wants to be in relationship with us. Not because we can force him to do that, but because He wants to do that. That's grace. We get better than we deserve from God. And that's mercy. We don't get what we deserve from God. That's mercy. All because he wants to. Little kids, they know, you guys know, that you're dependent on somebody else for your life. He wants us to go back and remember that too, adults and youth. He wants us to remember that we're reliant on him that it is His grace, it is His mercy that we rely on every single day. My prayer for each of us is that when we leave this place, that we're going to go back uh, into the world and we're going to live as a free people, not because of how good we are, but because how good our God is. Not because of how free we've made ourselves, but because of how free He's made us. We, we go back in the world and we say, man, um, 
I'm not perfect, and I'm not pure, and I'm not holy. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And when, we, and when we receive that mercy and that grace, then we go out and we live differently. Not to earn God's favor because we already have it. We go out to live that way because we want to say, God, thank you. Just like a child says thank you when they get food on the table. Right? Just like a child says thank you when they get an allowance for doing their chores. Just like a, a kid says, uh, you know, says thank you for that toy that you might buy them. We have the opportunity with our lives to say thank you. Not to earn God's favor and his grace and his mercy, but because we already have it. See these little kids? They're awesome. Be like them. Let's pray. God, thank you for who you are. And thank you that you're continually trying to make us young. Not innocent and pure and holy uh, like we tend to think uh, little babies might be. Um, But dependent on you, realizing that we can't earn it, we can't be good enough, and that we just rely on you for the love that you give us, for the life that you give us, for everything that you give us. You are an amazing God. Help us to see that right now. Help us to tear up our resume and stand before you as a tax collector who just says, Lord, have mercy on me. I want to do better tomorrow, but have mercy on me today so that I can. We love you. We're thankful for this word in our lives that you love the little children, that you walk on them, that they are precious to you. Help us to be like them so that we can receive the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, you can do that right where you're sitting, um, and you just kind of make your chair your altar. And I don't know what conversation you need to have uh, with God, but I trust the Holy Spirit to do His job. So I just invite you to take a time of prayer, and then we'll close with a, a final song.